Welcome, welcome, welcome to Metaphysical Bible Study. So happy to have you here uh, for um, this week's decoding. Uh, we will be decoding Genesis 37, which is the beginning of the story of Joseph. We've been working our way all the way through Genesis, started in Genesis chapter one months ago, and, um, and we're now just getting to Genesis 37. When you read the Bible in this way, it's not just reading it on the surface level and, and looking at the text. Uh, we're going a lot deeper than that, um, and we are really getting into the allegories, the stories, the metaphors, the parables, to figure out what is the true meaning of some of these stories that on the surface level don't make sense. Uh, my name is Julian Gordon, and I'm so excited to be here, so excited that uh, I've been blessed to be able to see some things in this particular text uh, based on the way my mind is designed and to share this journey with you. Uh, this journey was private um, and uh, I got called and uh, by spirit to um, share it and go on this journey with you publicly. And so I'm happy to have you along for this journey. And, um, and it's been a beautiful one. It's a fruitful one. Um, I read this text every single day um, to get deeper and deeper insights. And a lot has been real, revealed to me. And my uh, encouragement is not for you to believe what I believe. Okay. In fact, you don't believe me. I'm literally here to tell you, do not believe anything that I say. What I want to inspire is for you to do your own work, to study, to show thyself approved, right? I want you to read the text for yourself. I want you to read the text for yourself so that um, you don't have to go through any middle man or any middle woman to get to the truth. Back in the day, people were illiterate and they could not read the Bible. They could not read it, right? They were illiterate. But now you can read. And yes, this is a thick book. This is a thick book. But if you truly love God the way you say you do, then wouldn't you take the time to read this book? If you truly love God. And so a lot of people are cherry picking scriptures. They're talking about uh, um, uh, you're taking things out of context. But how am I taking things out of context when you haven't even read the text? How do you know if I'm taking anything out of context if you haven't even read the text? That means that you're taking things out of context if you haven't read the text in full. And so um, I know life is busy. You got a lot to do, but uh, there's nothing more important to me than to be in alignment with my creator um, and, uh, and my creator, how I define that. And I think we all have a different understanding and definition of God. To me, there's 7, million plus, uh, there's 7 billion um, plus religions in the world. Each one of us has our own unique relationship to the creator. You may have, you may think that your set is bigger than somebody else's. Oh yeah, we, we, we outnumber y'all this and that. Our way is the right way. Now we off that, okay? Each one of us has a unique relationship to source, God, creator, whatever you decide to call it. And, um, and my encouragement is for you to refine and define that relationship for yourself, okay? Um, and uh, you were meant to study to show thyself approved. So today we're gonna go through Genesis 37 and maybe get to 39. Um, and uh, we're gonna decode that as we get into the story of Joseph, right? If you're joining us for the first time on social media, please go to jointruthseekers.com. That's jointruthseekers.com. Um, and uh, you will be able to uh, follow along as we go through uh, I'll be sharing my screen here on the tablet um, in my notes. And uh, <laughs> yeah, let's get into it. So um, before we go forward, we, we do a couple of rituals and this is not any dogmatic space, but we do a couple of rituals. Um, and the one is just a, a breathing exercise. And that breathing is just a short meditation to connect with source, right? We all are here on this earth breathing. And uh, the easiest way to connect with your creator is through the breath. None of us can stop our breath, even in, except suicide, none of us can stop our breath. So what that means is that something is breathing through us on a consistent basis. And, and whatever that is, we want to honor it and we want to connect with it. Um, just like you plug in your cell phone all the time to get connected to electricity, and we can do the exact same thing with our breath. And um, that's what we're going to do. We're just going to take five breaths and you can connect. If you don't like this particular ritual, because um, we want as little rituals as possible, um, if you don't like this ritual, do whatever connects you with your creator. If it's hula hooping for you, if it's doing backflips and cartwheels for you, if it's getting on your knees and praying for you, if it's doing a praise and worship dance right now, whatever connects you with your source, I want you to be plugged in before we go into this study. So uh, with that, um, I'm going to lead uh, those who want to through uh, a breathing exercise. Uh, we're going to in heaven for four seconds. We're going to hold for one. And then we are going to, in heaven for one second, we're gonna hold for one. And then from there, we are going to, um, uh, from there, we are going to uh, exhale for, um, exhale for, uh, excuse me, just check. We're gonna exhale for five seconds. So 
in heaven for four, hold for one, then exhale for five, all right? We're just gonna do that five times and uh, uh, follow along if you choose to, right? In heaven, hold. Thank you, God. In heaven for four, hold for one, release. Thank you, God. In heaven for four. Hold. Release. In heaven for four. Hold. Release. In heaven for four. Hold. Release. Whatever you call that source and that entity that is bringing, uh, breathing through you on a daily basis, um, we give praises to it. We thank it for life. If we're still breathing, it means that we have a purpose still here on earth. We have work to do. And um, I believe that this is some of the work that we are meant to do is to seek truth um, for ourselves um, primarily. And again, this is not a space where I'm trying to convince or convert anybody. I'm just sharing my personal study. This is my personal study for me. And I just happen to be sharing it publicly. This is not a space to convince or convert anyone. I encourage you to do your own study for yourself. I do not want you to believe anything I say. Study it for yourself. And if you choose to believe it, then that's up to you because scripture says it is done unto you as you believe, not as I believe, but as you believe for you. Okay. So um, we have a, <laughs> we have a quick prayer, then we're going to get straight into it. Um, and uh, let me share, um, let me share my tablet now. Oh, where is it? It's called the truth seekers prayer. This was a divine download that was given to me um the divine download that was given to me uh that i think will give you the courage to do this work many people are afraid to do this work that we're doing they're afraid because uh religion teaches you not to question even though scripture says asking ye shall receive knock and the door shall be open and so we are meant to seek and this is why the url is join truthseekers.com because we are seeking the truth and if anybody scolds you for seeking the truth it's because they haven't sought the truth they have just accepted the program beliefs that they were giving as children, and they've never questioned anything, okay? And they're afraid to, because if they question things, they might find an answer that is uncomfortable. And we here, if you are here right now, uh, you are courageous, because when you ask questions, it may disrupt your existing paradigm. But if that existing paradigm is actually holding you back and not allowing you to uh, achieve or reach your full highest God self here on earth, then we are falling short. And so that is the goal of this particular study. So this is the Truth Seekers Prayer. I'm going to read it again. If you want to join us from social media, I'm sharing my screen right now uh, on Zoom. And so you can go to jointruthseekers.com and that will give you uh, access to the Zoom link. The Truth Seekers Prayer. We are truth seekers. We seek the whole truth and nothing but the truth. We know that the truth shall set us free. John 8, 32. We believe that when we ask, it shall be given to us. When we seek, we shall find. And when we knock, the door shall be opened unto us. Matthew 7, 7. We know that as we sit in the temple of our minds, listening for your voice and asking questions in that holy place, we shall find understanding and answers. Luke 2, 46 to 47. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Luke 12, 2. We know that because the Bible is heavily coded in allegories, Galatians 4.24, similes, Luke 13.18, and parables, Matthew 13.34, many who think they are seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand, including those who call themselves your disciples, Matthew 13.13. 13. We know that to, we know to not rely on the letter, but the spirit of the word, but the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life, 2 Corinthians 3.6. We are meant to study to show thyself approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15, 1 
wash our feet, which represents our understanding, so that we may build our church or temple, which is our individual belief system, upon a rock of truth that we are the sons and daughters of God, Matthew 16, 16. May we feel free to renew our minds, Romans 12, 2, by, uh, by destroying and rebuilding our temple over and over and get better at better, leaving no stone standing, Matthew 24, 2. We know that when we pray, we shall enter into the closet of our mind, shut the door, and pray to God, which is in secret, Matthew 6, 6. And we also know that where two or three are gathered in your name, I am is in the midst of them, Matthew 18, 20. We pray that this metaphysical Bible study blesses, builds, and brings all children of God closer to you, whether inside or outside of a religious context, even if that means wrestling with our concept of you for our blessing like Jacob, Genesis 32. We love you and thank you with all of our hearts, minds, and souls, Matthew 22, 37, Ashe, amen, and so it is, all right? Who is ready? Who is ready? If you are ready to do this work, please type ready. Again, this is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> this work is not for the faint of heart. Good, I see my regulars here. Um, it's so good to see you all. Um, I know we took a detour last week because of the conversation that was going on in the media. And last week we explored who are the true Jews? Who are the true Jews? And um, if you haven't seen that uh, teaching, um, I broke down the who are the true Jews from a biological, a historical and a biblical context. The answer is pretty clear of who the true Jews are. Not the Jewish, but who the true Jews are. And uh, if you're interested in knowing who you are, then I encourage you to uh, go back uh, to the YouTube channel and watch that particular uh, teaching, all right? Again, do not believe anything that I say. I'm not here to convince you or convert you of anything. I'm sharing my study with you, and I encourage you to go study the show that self approved and come to your own inner and understandings. The things that I'm sharing with you are things that have been revealed to me. And some people may not be ready to receive the things that have been revealed to me because they were for me. Okay. But I have been uh, called to share this journey publicly. And so that is what I'm doing. And today we are going to go forward into uh, Genesis. 37 okay this is the beginning of the story of jacob we are uh <laughs> this is the beginning of the story of jake i mean not jacob joseph so we are looking at joseph okay all right so if uh again if you're joining us on social media and you want to see my notes if you want to see my notes um from my bible here um you want to come join us at join truthseekers.com. Again, that's jointruthseekers.com to get the Zoom link. All right, <clears throat> cool. So let's get it in, family. So Genesis 37. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. We've already dissected or decoded what Canaan means. We looked at the Hebrew meaning of Canaan, and Canaan means land of purple and synchronicity. This is going to be very key to our teaching today, right? To our study today, excuse me. Canaan, the Hebrew meaning, means land of purple or synchronicity, okay? Verse two, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, Zilpah his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report, okay? So evil report, that sounds odd. Um, and then we have the number 17 there. And um, I was not able to decode what the symbolism is beyond for the number 17 and what this evil report was because Joseph actually does not mention anything about the evil report going forward, okay? <clears throat> so going on to verse three. Now, Israel, right, you see that we started out with Jacob. We know that Jacob's name was changed to Israel, right? And so the chapter starts with the name Jacob, but now they're using Israel. We know that everything in this book is intentional, okay? So now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, right? So it sounds like some favoritism there. We know that Joseph means he will add. Joseph means he will add. 
and he made him a coat of many colors. Stop, freeze, pause. A coat of many colors. When I read this, and I read this story many times in the past, but it became so clear. It just hit me like a ton of bricks. What is the coat of many colors that is around or in the body? It's clearly the chakra system, family. It's undeniably the chakra system. Why all of a sudden would Jacob or Israel give Joseph a coat of many colors? That's odd, right? But when you make the connection that the chakra system is literally a coat of many colors that is around the body, and we know that we've been able to map a lot of the biblical stories to the body, it makes sense. Joseph's coat of many colors is representative of the chakra system, okay? So I just want you to try that on. Try on the coat. Don't believe me, okay? But try on the coat and run with it and see if it fits, okay? <laughs> so, because already we know that Canaan means what? Land of what? What color is Canaan? Canaan is purple, right? Canaan is land of purple. What is the crown chakra colored? The crown chakra just happens to be colored purple. I'm not talking about the movie, y'all. <laughs> the crown chakra happens to be colored purple and Canaan happens to mean land of purple. Coincidence? Maybe. Probably not. <laughs> okay? So, verse four. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Okay? So, while we're reading this, I also want you to think about the connection between the Jesus story and Joseph's story. Remember, as we've looked at the patriarchs in Genesis, we've been able to do T-charts and actually show how similar Jesus' story was to Noah, how similar it was to Jacob, how similar it was to Isaac, how similar it was to Adam. And so now we want to do the same thing with the Joseph story, because based on my understanding, what I've decoded, the Jesus story is an amal a single character amalgamation of all of these other patriarchs in the Bible into one character. Whoever wrote the New Testament, European influence, and how do you know it has European influence? How do you know the New Testament has European influence, family? One, it's written in what language? It's written in Greek, right? In Aramaic. Then on top of that, there are no people in this region of the world named Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. There are no people in this region of the world named Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Why in the Old Testament are there all these crazy names, but all of a sudden when we get to the New Testament, the names feel a little white. They feel a little European. This is how you know there was influence from a culture that is not indicative of the characters in this particular narrative. <laughs> okay? So moving forward. <clears throat> so we know that God loved Abel more than Cain, right? We know the story of the prodigal son. So we know and we've seen favoritism from father figures throughout Genesis thus far. Okay, we've seen favoritism by fathers throughout Genesis thus far. Okay, um, verse five. <clears throat> and Jesus dreamed, and excuse me, <laughs> and Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet more. Okay, and they hated him yet more. Okay, this is just a side note, and this is where many of the ministers in today's churches, this is where they stop. 
they have turned the scripture into just motivation. Okay, but we're going to seek the truth. And the truth is actually more motivational than trying to turn the scripture into motivational platitudes. You realize how personal development, how personal development TE <laughs> churches become? And that's, it's not a bad thing. But if we're going to do personal development, we can do that in addition to getting to the truth of what this book is really trying to tell us. So on the personal development tip, basically don't tell your dreams to non-believers or doubters. There's levels to this. And today's ministers have chosen to stop at the inspirational, motivational level, okay? We're going deeper into the scripture, to the true meaning, to get to our true identity. Why are we actually here? Not just to get inspired. So verse five, and Joseph dreamed a dream and he told it to his brethren and they hated him yet more. Don't tell your dreams to non-believers or doubters. Okay? They will hate you for them. Verse six. And he said unto them, here, I pray you this dream, which I have dreamed. So again, we still have not no inclination of the evil report, unless this is the evil report, okay? Unless this is the evil report, we have no indication of what the evil report J Joseph was talking about in verse two, okay? Now, for behold, we are binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheave stood round about and made, ob oh, excuse me, obeisance to my sheaf. So to pay, bow down or pay respects. So this is a foreshadowing. If you read Genesis in full, this is a foreshadowing of his brothers eventually coming to Egypt for grain. Okay. So when you are writing history, is it possible to foreshadow? When you are writing history, history just happens. But is it possible to foreshadow when you're documenting history? Or is that only possible in a, as a literary tool if it's a story? How do you have foreshadowing in history? Okay, so that's just something to consider. It's a question. I'm not coming to any conclusion, okay? okay? When you come to a conclusion, it means that you're cut off from any new possibility. I am always learning and seeking and open. But many people have come to conclusions about what they believe, and this is why they're limited and they're cut off from learning anything else because the door is closed, okay? So this is a foreshadow of them coming to Egypt. And the other week, we talked about the difference between history and story. The difference between history and story is what, family? A date. The difference between history and story is a date. Do you realize in the Bible, there are no dates? Oh, Julian, they had different calendars, different people, this and that. Nobody put a date anywhere. We're about to celebrate Christmas, right? Well, some people are about to celebrate Christmas. December 25th is not in the Bible. So where did it come from? It's the winter equinox. In the winter equinox, the sun, uh, the sun is down for longer than any day, right? That's Jesus going into the tomb. And then after that, it reaches its point, and then it starts to resurrect. The sun, as in the solar sun, and the son of God. That is the symbolism of the December 25th. December 25th is not in the Bible. Okay, these are just some things for you to consider. Okay, so 
Verse eight, and his brethren said unto him, shalt thou indeed reign over us or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words, okay? So, <clears throat> and he dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren and said, behold, Joseph hasn't learned his lesson. He continues to tell doubters and non-believers his dreams. I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obeisance to me. So the sun is Jacob, right? Connection to Jesus, son of God. The moon being Rachel, his mother, and the stars being his brothers. And he told it to his father and to his, and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, what is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to the, uh, to the earth? Okay, notice that earth is not capitalized. Yeah, excuse me, not winter, not winter um, uh, equinox, winter solstice, thank you. Notice that earth is not capitalized. Why would earth not be capitalized? Why would earth not be capitalized? Because we're not talking about the earth and the earth as we know it. This is story. This is allegory. Okay? Earth is capitalized in the Bible in other places. It's not capitalized here. So there's inconsistency. Okay? In verse 11, and his brethren envied him, but his father observed the same. His father observed the same. So that's interesting. And I've yet to crack that particular code. Why his father heard him, but his brothers did not. Okay? So before we go forward, I want to dig a little bit further into the chakras. Okay? So again, if you're joining us on social media, go to jointruthseekers.com so you can follow along and actually see my tablet and my screen and my research, and uh, we'll go from there. So as you can see at the top, this is a larger image of the chakra system and Joseph's coat of many colors representing the chakra system. And during this reading from Genesis 37 through 41, we're not gonna do all those chapters today. Um, we're gonna do 37, we're gonna skip 38 and go to 39, 40, then 41 <clears throat> over the next few weeks. I will show you how Joseph goes through each stage of the chakra system. Can't make this up. In simple form, Joseph begins where? In the pit. The pit would represent which chakra, y'all? The pit would represent what chakra? The root chakra. It is at the base. He's in the pit. And where does, where does Joseph ultimately ascend to? Where does Joseph ultimately ascend to? Where did Joseph ultimately ascend to? The crown chakra at the right hand of Pharaoh. So you knowing that, this journey, we are simply going to fill in the gaps. We're gonna fill in the gaps between the root chakra and the crown chakra, and you're going to see. And you will see it, I will show it to you, and you can make your decision and choices from there, all right? Now, if we go back to, if we go back to Genesis, right? Because in the chakra system, there's an energy called kundalini energy that rises up from the root chakra to the crown chakra. Kundalini energy is a form of energy that remains coiled up at the base of the spine when it is raised. The kundalini flows through the seven chakras, which instantly leads to spiritual enlightenment. Kundalini can be aroused through various methods, including meditation, yoga, and mantras, okay? What do you see is represented by kundalini energy? What animal is representing kundalini energy? It is a snake. It is a serpent. And what was present in Genesis chapter two? What was present in Genesis chapter two? A snake, a serpent. And in Genesis chapter two, that snake was also standing up. 
And why is that significant? Because in Genesis 2, 7, God made man from dirt or dust. Adam means, what does Adam mean, y'all? Adam means red man or son of red earth. What color is the root chakra? Adam, the Hebrew meaning of the word Adam means red man or son of the red earth. And the root chakra happens to be red. And so this serpent standing takes, goes all the way up. And in Genesis 3, talking to Eve said, and the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die for God doth know that in this day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as gods. So the serpent is basically saying that you will be able to elevate from the root chakra up to the crown chakra into your God self. If you didn't watch the decoding of Genesis 2, I encourage you to go look at that. What you known as original sin may actually not be true. It might have been designed that way for our growth and expansion. Okay? So Genesis 2 and 3 is really about elevating from the root chakra, from the dust, from the dirt, from the red earth to the crown chakra. All right? So this is just something to consider. It's something for you to consider that there's a serpent in Genesis 2 and 3. Kundalini energy is represented as a serpent going from the root chakra to the crown chakra. Adam means red man. And eating of the apple, right, was representing, would mean stepping into your godhood. They would be as gods. Right? So moving forward, it is very clear to me that um, in the, uh, <coughs> um, the third eye chakra, which is the sixth chakra, we've already seen this in Genesis 32, okay? We've already seen this in Genesis 32. In Genesis 32, 30, and Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. So where Jacob wrestled God or the angel of God, Jacob named that place Peniel. And we just happen to have a gland right here called the Peniel gland. You think that's a coincidence? Of all the words that Jacob could have used to name that place, he named it Peniel. Okay? And we know throughout scripture in the New Testament, we see the eye come up many times. The third eye, your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eyes are healthy, the whole body is also full of light. That's what the pineal gland does. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. That's Matthew 6, 22. The first one was Luke eleven thirty four. 34. Those are similar renditions of the same scripture, okay? Mark 9, 47, and if your eye cause you to stumble, see it says eye singular, pluck it out. <clears throat> it is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye, your third eye, than to have two eyes, your conscious physical eyes, and be thrown into hell. These are the eyes that deceive you. This eye does not deceive you. This is the single eye right here. And we know that this kundalini energy rising up the what? The spine. The spine has how many vertebrae, family? The spine has how many vertebrae? Anybody know? 33. And Jesus was crucified and resurrected at what age? At 33. Is it starting to make sense? The resurrection is resurrecting from the son of man, which is the physical root chakra, essence of who we are, the physical body consciousness, all the way up to our crown chakra, 
which is our spiritual consciousness. That is the resurrection that is occurring in each one of us on this spiritual journey. We are human beings having a spiritual experience. We came from spirit into the body and we get to enjoy this journey of going from body back to spirit. We are returning home. We are the prodigal son and daughter. We are the prodigal son and daughter. Why we signed up for this craziness? I don't know. <laughs> Why we signed up for it? I don't know. It was just another video game that we could play and we all accept the challenge. <laughs> we all decided to play out this simulation and see if we could do it. So here we are, spirit limited by flesh and the five senses trying to break free from the bondage of the body in time. Okay, so we know that scripture is all about the body, right? In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, one of my favorite scriptures, do you not know that your bodies are temples? The temple is not some building that you go to on a Sunday. It is not a synagogue. It is not a mosque. Did you know that your body are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you, ever, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. Your body is the temple. Matthew 21, 12, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of, the, of those selling doves. It is, it is written, he said, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. What does this symbolize? You think a character named Jesus went into a temple and started, had a temper tantrum? This, this, this uh, man of peace, always perceived as having an olive branch, went in the temple and just started overturning tables? No. What it's saying is that our temple is not supposed to be focused on money all the time. That is the metaphor and the allegory that is here. Our temple, the house of God, is not meant to be focused on money all of the time. But if you look at humanity, 90% of us plus focus so much of our thought energy on money changing. Matthew 4, 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the what? Of the temple. This is not a physical temple. Jesus didn't go up on the roof talking about reaching your highest level of consciousness in your temple up here. These are your temples. This is the most important block in the world. This is about going up to the highest point in your consciousness, looking out at this physical reality, this material experience that we have here on earth and saying, this is not my address. This is not where I'm from. I belong to, and I'm one with something that is greater than this. Elevating above the body consciousness. And then in Acts 17, 24, the God who made the world, <laughs> the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. You don't have to go to church to find God. You don't have to go to a building to find God. You have to go within yourself. You go in the closet of your own mind. See, People take the scripture literally when Jesus said he only spoke in parables. So when he says go in the closet and shut the door, people think you literally need to go into a closet and shut the door. And that's why you go to Catholic church and some of these churches and they have prayer closets. That's not what the scripture was saying. It was a parable. It was a metaphor. But when you take it literally, you misunderstand. And now you have all of these false rituals that don't bring you closer to God. There's nothing that you need. There's no place that you need to go to actually connect with the creator, except within. There's no tools that you need. You don't need to pay anybody anything. You can go directly to the source whenever you desire. The chakra system was documented between 500 BC, 1500 BC and 500 BC. So the question becomes, okay, when was this story of Joseph? So we look at the story of Joseph and it looks like Joseph was around 18 
98 BC. So it looks like the story of Joseph came before the chakra system. But you got to keep in mind, this ancient wisdom wasn't documented until that time, but the ancient wisdom existed prior to that time. Any kind of wisdom, be it chakras or something else, was passed down to the next generation by word of mouth. Now, if anybody wants to debate that and say, yeah, you can't say that. Well, when did Moses write the first five books of the Bible? When did Moses write the first five books of the Bible? Moses supposedly wrote the first five books of the Bible in about, uh, what is this, 14, 2,500 years after these supposed events occurred. <clears throat> Moses wrote the <laughs> first five books of the Bible about 2,500 years. Man, we can't even play a game of telephone with five people in the room and get a message across from one person to the fifth person without the message getting distorted. And you telling me that Moses wrote Genesis 2,500 years after it happened. So it was all passed down through oral tradition and it lasted and was preserved for 2,500 years. That's what you're telling me? That's what you're telling me? A lot of this was oral tradition. And so, this is just important to know and look at the timeline. This also suggests that Adam, this timeline suggests that Adam was born or created, or wasn't born, Adam was created in 400, around 4,000 BC. We have fossils that go way back further than that. We have fossils, human fossils, not another type of Homo sapien or anything like that, Homo erectus, nothing like that. We have fossils that go back way further than that. So how could that be? Going into verse 12. And his brethren went to feed their father in she uh, father's flock in Shechem. Shechem, the Hebrew meaning means shoulder or personal interest. So the brothers were feeding the thought of the mind, which is the flock, with envy and personal interest. The brothers were feeding the flock. You ever been in a conversation, you start fueling the fire and it just gets worse and worse and worse. You're feeding that thought pattern, okay? And Israel said unto Joseph, do not, uh, do not thy brethren feed thy flock in Shechem. Come and I will send thee unto them. And he said unto him, here I am. Now we've seen this phrase, here I am, back with Isaac, um, Abraham and Isaac. When Abraham was taking Isaac up to the mountain, Abraham said, here I am three times. We've seen this over and over and over. Here I am, here I am. And we're still trying to figure out what the meaning and significance of it is, <clears throat> okay? Verse 14, and he said to him, go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the, the flocks and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the veil, which is the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. So Hebron, Hebron means place of joining or alliance. Okay, we've seen Hebron before. So, so Joseph is moving from a place of oneness to a place of personal interest or individuality and separation. We're going, this is a journey from a place of alliance and oneness to consciousness moving towards a place of personal interest. Just a minute ago, we were a happy family. And all of a sudden, Joseph has shared some dreams. And now his brothers have a personal interest. And the alliance and the joining is gone. And a certain man, and they were jealous because the father, right, loved Joseph more and gave him this coat of many colors. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest, seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence, for I have heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. Dothan means decree or well. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. Right? 
And verse 18, and when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. Okay. And they said one to another, behold, this dreamer cometh. Verse 20. And now, therefore, let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say some evil beast has devoured him and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And verse 21, and Reuben heard it and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. Listen to what, think about who Reuben is in the Jesus story, y'all. Think about who Reuben is in the Jesus story. <laughs> Verse 22. Verse 22. And Reuben said unto them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness and lay no hand upon him that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. Verse 23, and it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. What was Jesus stripped of, y'all? What was Jesus stripped of? The parallel is so clear. What was Jesus stripped of? Do you remember? On the way to Golgotha, which means place of the skull. So Jesus was resurrected in the place of the skull. What was Jesus stripped of? Jesus was stripped of his robe. So here we have Joseph stripped of the robe, and then we have Jesus stripped of a robe. You know who Reuben represents in the Jesus story? Reuben represents Pilate. Pilate did not want the blood on his hands. So he did everything possible to try to free Jesus. Reuben is representing Pilate. That is the parallel between the two stories, okay? The brothers wanna kill him. The crowd wants to kill him. The brothers represent the disciples, okay? And so <clears throat> verse 24, and when they took him and cast him into the pit and the pit was empty, there was no water in it. We know that the pit is the root chakra. This is where the story begins. This is where all of our story begins, in the root chakra. Where was Jesus born, y'all? Where was Jesus born? Where was Jesus born? In a manger. Why? Because it was the spiritual coming in to the animalistic self which is the body. And we are meant to come like Adam and subdue the animalistic flesh that we are born into. When Noah created the ark and Noah means rest, which is like meditation, what did he have to do? He had to subdue and gather all of the animals into darkness. And after that meditation in the flood, Noah ended up elevated on Mount Ararat because he had elevated in consciousness after being in meditation. That's what Noah means. Noah means rest. We saw the parallel between Noah and Jesus. Jesus was a carpenter and Noah somehow built a boat. Had to have some carpentry skills for that. So again, this Jesus story is like a, a summer, summary into one character of all these other stories that were in the Old Testament. I don't know if the people were like, look, these people ain't gonna read this Old Testament. They illiterate first and foremost, and we need to simplify this for folks. So we're gonna put it all in one character that fulfills everything that these other characters are supposed to fulfill. It's easy to do. The Old Testament was there. You could literally just make a character that fulfilled all of these things and use the archetypes from the old stories in the narrative of this character, which then makes it believable. Because if it happened in the past, then I can believe that it's going to happen or that it did happen now. So now he's in the pit. Verse 25, and they sat down to eat bread. 
They sat down to eat bread. What was Jesus doing with the disciples? It was called the Last Supper. And what did they eat? They ate bread. Okay. And they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites, okay, came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. Oh, my goodness. Who came to Jesus at birth, family? Who came to Jesus at birth? The three magi, right? And what were they bringing with them? What did they bring with them? The same exact things. Come on, y'all. And Judah said unto his brethren, what profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and, <coughs> and, not, <laughs> and not our hand be upon him. For he is our brother and our flesh and his brethren were content. Who does Judah represent? Who wants to sell Jesus? Who does Judah represent right now? Judah represents Judas. It's the same story, y'all. Repackaged with new names. Judas sold Jesus. Now Judah is selling Joseph or the other way around from a sequence standpoint. Are you seeing this? Are you seeing this? Verse 28, in there past the Midianites, Midianites means strife or place of judgment, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. You wanna know how much Judas sold Jesus for? 30 pieces of silver. Judah sold Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. G Judas sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. It's the same story with different characters. And Reuben returned unto the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes, meaning he ripped his clothes. Who ripped their clothes? Who ripped their clothes when they realized that Jesus was not in the tomb? Who ripped their clothes when they realized Jesus was not in the tomb? The high priest. The high priest ripped his clothes when he realized that Jesus was not in the tomb. And he returned unto his brethren and said, the child is not, and I, whither shall I go? Verse 31, and they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of goat and dipped the coat in blood. <clears throat> So verse 32, and he sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, this have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. Verse 33, and he knew it and said, it is my son's coat and evil beast has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces or ripped in pieces. Verse 34, and Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And 30, verse 35, and all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, for I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Verse 36, they say there's no errors in the Bible. Here's one right for you. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard. If you go back to Genesis 37, 28, it said, there passed the Midianites by the merchantmen, and they drew him and lifted him up of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites. So Joseph was sold to the Ishmaelites, right? But in verse 36, it said the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar. 
So if the Bible is so sacred and pure and there's no error in it, you've just found one. It was not, it's verse 28 says the Midianites did, right? No, the Ishmaelites had Joseph. The Midianites had sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces. The Midianites somehow sold him to Egypt, to Potiphar. Here is an error in the perfect Bible. Chapter 37. So as we go through this, I'm not going to show you that yet. As we go through this, we're going to continue to see the parallel between Joseph and Jesus. We're going to, <laughs> excuse me, we're going to continue to see the chakra system play out as we go from the root chakra, right, which is the pit, to the crown chakra, which is the right hand of Pharaoh. I'm going to map those out for you as we go. We are going to continue this journey. We're going to skip over chapter 38. And we're going to go to 39 next week. It's more synchronous with the Joseph story. Chapter 38 is kind of an aside. So we're going to go to chapter 39 next week. In fact, I want you to read 39, 39 and uh, 40. <clears throat> I want you to read chapter 39 and 40. I want you to continue to observe the parallels between Joseph and Jesus's life. I want you to look for the chakra system, right? And see if you can see the parallels between the seven chakras and the way that this story is written and the sequence that this story is written. And uh, we'll be back same time, six o'clock next Sunday. And um, yes, I'm so grateful for all of you for the courage that you have to go uh, on this journey. I know this shakes up um, people talk about shaking their faith. <clears throat> if your faith is shaken, um, then it probably wasn't that strong. And Jesus talked about tearing down the temple and rebuilding it. And yeah, that means be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you constantly have to go through this process of tearing down your temple and strengthen the foundation so that you could build up higher and higher and higher. If you've been so caught up in the religious program that you had as a child and you never questioned anything, then that is something to question. Why haven't you questioned or challenged anything? Why do you feel afraid to have a thought that is different from the one you've been programmed to believe? Why so much fear? Aren't you just seeking truth? So for those of you who are in the comments and throwing shade, I'm pretty bright over here. So shade don't really do nothing over here. My sun is shining. My light is lit. My challenge to all of you is to go read the text for yourself. That is the most rewarding thing that I did on my spiritual journey. I read the entire text for myself. So don't come at me in the comments or in chat if you have not read the book for yourself. You say you love your God so much, then why not read his book? You read all kinds of textbooks in college. You got all kinds of books on your bookshelf. You watch YouTube all the time. You're watching me right now. Why haven't you read the book yet? How do you live by and die by a book that you haven't even read? How do you live by and die by and swear by a book you have not read? You are not illiterate, family. You are not illiterate anymore. Is the book thick? Yes, yeah, thick but I've studied to show myself approved. And this is where these divine downloads come from. This is how I can make correlations between the Old Testament and the New Testament, between this character and that character. And so that's my challenge to you. I don't need you to believe what I believe. Scripture says it is done unto you as you believe. What I want for you is to come to your own beliefs outside of the programming that you have received from religion. The Bible is not a religious book. It is not a Christian book. Christians use the Bible heavily, but it is not a Christian book. There is a ton of life wisdom in this book. It has stood the test of time. And for those of you who have left Christianity and other faiths, I encourage you not to throw out the Bible with the baptism water. Let's put all the rituals and the dogma aside 
And let's get to the truth of what this book is really trying to tell us, why it has lasted so long. And then let's use that truth and that wisdom to get free. I appreciate each and every one of you for being here. Um, for those of you on social media, please go to jointruthseekers.com. Actually, no, there's no please. If you feel attracted to this message, you'll come naturally. This is no begging here. I don't really market this. <laughs> I'm a great marketer. I don't market this. This is law of attraction. If you feel attracted and inspired and lit up by this message, then you'll go to jointruthseekers.com. I don't need to beg you. Those who are ready will come. And those who aren't, won't. And I'm okay with that. All right? So with that, I love each and every one of you. I encourage you to read this text daily if you can. I encourage you to meditate daily if you can. And this replay will be up on YouTube soon. All right? Again, that's jointruthseekers.com. If you're interested in continuing this conversation, homework is Genesis 38 and, no, Genesis 39 and 40 for next week. And I'll see you same time next week. All right? Much love, y'all. Appreciate you. Peace.